Can you explain first what primer sessions are for those unfamiliar with it? The answer is really in the in the word primer. So you're priming the body um, for activity, essentially. How would you like to use them? Because there's kind of different schools of thought. So we all know um, professional sports. You look at the NBA, you look at American football. They're all lifting as close to, to throw in or to kick off. Um, NBA basketballers will actually you know hit the gym after um, train sessions, which is which is totally fine as well. And there's such a misconception over the last decade of you should not be lifting close to your to your match, which is right in a state of if the volume's too high, that will have a negative effect on your performance. But if you get this gym sessions right, then it will have a, a positive effect. So out of the whatever amount of clients I have in a coaching app, they, some people will be able to handle primers, some won't. So in a team setting, you've got to be careful. Can all your players handle the priming for the pitch? Like some of the lads might just step out and do a bit of stretching and then go on out in the pitch. But some people have been lifting over the last couple of years and can handle the primers. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the GA Lean Body Podcast or the Lean Body Podcast for GA players. I'm delighted to be joined today with a guest who hasn't been on this show and I don't know how I've done... 80 episodes or so without having bring in and having to speak to this man who has transitioned dramatically over the past 18 24 months and is putting out great content online instagram in particular i'll link it in the show notes for people to check out after shane rice welcome to the podcast yes brian great to be back uh chatting it's been a been a while a few years i remember we done a video back in 2016 2017 but this is long overdue good to be here a hundred percent and it's funny because we used to chat back and forth quite a lot on social and then obviously the last 14 months or so you've got your little girl at home yeah. and, and even work-wise mate like you were grinding you're putting in so much work with players with teams but i want to start on that because when we spoke first and i think it was on your podcast or it was a youtube series of a social mm-hmm. media we were bouncing back and forth but a lot of your content at the time was c- kind of similar to me it was documenting your journey as a player where in the last 18 24 months you've changed it now to that I'm the coach and this is what you should do, partly because that's what you're doing with teams and working, but it's also providing so much value for players. Talk to us a little bit about that transition over the past few years for you. Yeah, I mean, whenever I started, it was all about, you know, me, what am I doing as a player? How can I provide value as a player? But over the last year or two, it's been how can I provide value to other coaches and still to other players? But from, from, from me, um, I'm responsibility as a coach now rather than a player. I think I can see more things even more clearly, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. any value that I give on social media, it's as, it's as a coach. And uh, you probably have learned a lot of mistakes and you've learned a lot of uh, things from your playing days. So you're just trying to give that back a, a, as a coach, you know. So it has drastically changed. And if I did look back whenever we started speaking at the very start, there wasn't that many in Gaelic football social media. Whereas now mm-hmm. there's, there's lots and lots of people, which is great. And that's probably why we haven't uh, connected as much. Probably because back then it was like me, you. Obviously, you were in the you were in the game a bit longer than me with the with the bodybuilding stuff and the body composition stuff. And then I was just trying to look up to you in terms of how to get the, the GA thing going. So that's probably where the the disconnection's been. But it's great that there's so much out there information for Gaelic players and coaches um in the modern day, which is great. Oh, hundred oh, percent. Like I remember when we had these conversations back and forth. And maybe there was a handful of others, but that was it on social media. Like you're talking Snapchat days and early Instagram, like that's where the content was going out. And, you know, we had kind of unique perspectives because I always think from a GA player standpoint and as a coach, your mess becomes your message. And Mm. I was the GA player that wanted to be muscular and have a six pack, but also be crushing it on my senior team. And your side was, again, performance based and you put out great stuff for performance based. and, And there's a lot of athletes who have fall somewhere in between. Shane, with the mistakes you see players make, because you have great videos, reels, and TikToks. One of your TikToks is my favorite. I think it's an old one. <laughs> it's only a joke TikTok where you're like, it was like, a, 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 whatever, a minute to go, two points down, oh, and you yeah. keep a point. <laughs> yeah. I, I fucking love that reel. It's one of my favorites. I saved it, and I'm like, that's class. But with the mistakes players make, particularly in the training side, mm-hmm. or what you see most often with individual players or with teams what are some of the common mistakes they're still making now in 2024 again this is coming from the coach in me rather than the player and um, i think when you're a player uh, things become a little bit more cloudy you don't really have a clear 
insight of what you should be definitely doing, you know, 24-7. But as a coach, you are responsible. Again, like I'm responsible for two football teams in Dublin, uh, one in men and one ladies. And the big thing that's massive for the players as a coach is that they can see um, what they're doing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and even down the line, and having that structure to the year. So if you're a player, you should be able to see in September, in October, in August, what you're doing, whether it's um, even going on holidays and putting your training around that, and what gym phase you're going to be in, uh, what conditioning block are you going to be in, what your nutrition going to be like. So rather than just winging it day to day, and rather than winging it week to week, as a coach and as a player, have a full like cycle of 12 months done out, whether it's on your laptop, whether it's on your notes. And I think that's really important for me anyway. I'm someone that has to have structure. Like if you ask me, what is your football team doing in September on the 7th? I know exactly what training we're doing. So for me, that's just my personality. But I think that would benefit all players that are listening to this and coaches that if you have a structure for the year, that, that'll stand you. You'll be more organized and stuff. So I think that's a big thing, not without going too deep into nutrition and training. That's the number one. You have to have structure to the year before you dive into the nitty gritty stuff. What would a training phase, for example, look like then, Shane? Because something that I made a mistake as a player and that I'm very mindful of as a coach now is not having the phases in relation to the time of the season. Like mm-hmm. I was the player that was, you know, coming into May, April or April, May, June, coming into championship time, crushing gym workouts when actually I should have been deloading and scaling back to prioritize performance. But I, I didn't know at the mm-hmm. time, again, your mess becomes your message. What would a typical phase look like without going through the entire 12 months, just to give a kind of a brief outline for a player who's listening going, right, this is how I need to look at my next six, eight, 12 months. Yeah, so whenever I speak, I try to keep it really simple in laid man terms so everyone can understand it. So essentially, the more times or the higher volume that you're on the pitch, the, the volume will have to decrease in the gym. Whereas a lot of people will think they have to do five, six gym sessions a week in the heat of the summer. But your priority is on the pitch and that gym work has to back off and vice versa. If you're doing in the off season or pre-season, the volume on the pitch is a lot lower than what it will be in the summer. So then you can put that extra volume to the gym. Now, having said that, you will realize that throughout the 12 months, the gym doesn't become you know zero. It's not as if you just don't go and you give all your time to the pitch because that's where injuries will happen. You're not bulletproofed. Um, but just understanding when to knock it up a notch in the gym, when to pull it back on the pitch and vice versa. Now, again, your coaches should have that under control but i do understand throughout the thousands of clubs throughout the the country that level of coaching just isn't there and not every club team has an snc coach and it is important for the players to have that value online from people like ourselves so that they're not making the same mistakes that we made back 10 years ago when there was no content online um yeah yeah sorry go on no continue shane so without diving in too much to it it's just really um knowing and having the basic knowledge of when to wrap it up in the gym and when to pull it back on the pitch and vice versa. And usually that happens is as you go on throughout the year, the pitch priority becomes more and more important and the gym backs off. And let's say in the off season, you go from four days a week to one or two days a week in season. I love that. Yeah, I have historically and every player is different worked off that five day split so if you're in the off season it might be five gym workouts because there's no pitch sessions and then in the season it'll be you know maybe two pitch sessions in a game so maybe two gym sessions that go alongside that and that can work for a lot of players as a baseline with exercise and program design then is there any and i'm just curious because anytime i talk to another snc coach i'm always curious do you have any favorite exercises that Again, every player is different, injuries, biomechanics, their height, their weight, all of this. But do you have any go-to exercise choices that you're like, I'll just love these for my GA players? Yeah, I think from my days on the floor, s and in, in, in abroad in Canada, I kind of had like a library in my head and also in my laptop. And you'll find with a lot of coaches online that try to make it a bit more complicated than it should be. You know, try to look at your exercises as movements, okay? 
So a push movement, okay? Let's not overly complicate things. Very, very simple, your bench press. There you go. Don't have to be anything crazy where you're laying on the floor and you're doing single arm and half the body is off the floor and all that carry on. Just keep it really simple. Your squat pattern, you're going to be looking at your front squat, your back squat, your box squat, um, your, your split squat, which is your single leg stuff. So look at everything in movement patterns rather than just having this mad library of 100 plus exercises and you're chopping and changing. Um, for example, right now, my Parnell lads in Dublin, we are in a strength phase. So our goal is strength. Now, we don't really change the exercise coming off hypertrophy, for example, in the off season. So why would I move from a box squat? They're getting all this great benefits of a box squat for six weeks. And then they go to a totally different exercise and they feel as if they have to start again. So the movement pattern is still there. Just try to keep the exercises pretty similar. Like I might only rotate between oh god 30 to 35 max throughout the year and um, so the exercises stay pretty similar but the goal of the exercise changes and maybe the progression or the regression would change so in the off season for example take the squat you'll do a regular goblet squat okay right you've got the goblet squat what's next right a regular barbell squat okay bang on how do we progress then we can go heavier by doing a box squat more so in season Okay, bang on. So they have the squat pattern there. How can we progress from a bilateral movement? Go to a unilateral. Can we do a split squat? Bang on. Can we elevate the heel? Um, done. Can we then elevate to a Bulgarian split squat? So the same pattern is there. It's just that you're not messing around with the exercises too much throughout the year. We don't need to complicate it. That's great advice. And it gives me a nice lead on to the next question because something that when I was a player that I didn't understand now more so as a coach was that adaption. I would regularly go into the gym and was doing random exercises I'd either see online or sometimes they were really good. They were SNC based exercises because that was still part of my background because obviously playing sport all my life. But I would change it to rapidly. I would literally be going in and doing lunges one day. Mm. I would do squats on another day. I would be changing as opposed to adapting like you mentioned there. I'm curious, Shane, from your first-hand perspective, what's something that you did as a player that you now feel completely different about as a coach? Yeah, so again, I'd say I speak for a lot of us, the high reps in season. I mean, I remember I actually back in 2016, um, I was playing in Louth, and uh, I couldn't play a match because my doms were that bad. Mm-hmm. But I, we didn't, I didn't know any better. i just seen... Because bodybuilding on social media and body composition and the influencers within the bodybuilding uh, community was way ahead of S&C and sports performance. So people were looking up to your YouTubers that were doing 4x8, 5x12, all this mad stuff. Um, and we thought that's what you need to do to, to, to build up your legs for, for sport, which was is not the case. And it's still not the case, but I don't think the younger GA community um, follow that style of training. I think there is enough value and content online to stay away from that. So just off the top of my head, high reps uh, in season completely killed me as a player. Um, if only I had... Um, like I'm 31 like if I was early 20s 10 years ago um, if only I had someone like ourselves to look up to and say right look this is the way your program should look in season who knows you, you might have performed a bit better um, that's just one of the things um, a, th- a speed is massive uh, focus nowadays there was no speed talk back 10 years ago like you, how many times you would google how to get faster for GA how to get faster for sports there was very little stuff of course the SNC and coaches were out there but the the old school top class SNC coaches with let's say professional soccer teams weren't pushing out content like they are today and speed nowadays a lot of young players understand how to get faster and that was something last or uh, ten years ago that we had no knowledge. You, you, you sprinted now and again once a month and thought that this is going to get quicker, or you just were told that you're genetically going to be slow. You you know your your father was slow as a player. You're going to be slow. That's not that's not the case. So just those little things ten years ago that it's just improved so much over the last decade on uh, the content online that's helping young people. Interesting you say that too, because something about speed that I didn't know, because I was fortunate, like I couldn't get high because I'm five foot eight and bit like a little hobbit, but at least I was fast and I was quick. Um, and something I didn't realize about speed was you can make yourself even a slow player faster or a fast player even faster, but you have to maintain it. I didn't realize that if you did a speed block, you have to do maintenance speed work or else you regress back to your normal baseline. Like that's something that just makes so much sense when you say it and so many GA players are like oh I got really fast when I was doing Brian's program or working with Shane or working with another coach 
And then it just stopped. I'm like, well, did you maintain it though? Did you do any of the maintenance work? And they're like, oh no. It's like, well, that's why. For a player that wants to get faster, Shane, again, individualized programs and there's, there's kind of, everyone's going to be different. What would a structured, or what would be, let me rephrase that slightly, what would be some of the principles you would get them to look at? Would you get them to look at the training side, the recovery element, glute direct work, speed work, over speed training, anything along those lines that you have a favor or preference for, for a player who's listening going, oh, actually, I want to get faster because what player doesn't want to get quicker? How would you suggest they potentially approach a program? So again, when answering these questions, I have to answer, am I answering as a coach or am I answering as a player or am I answering as a coach with an individual player? So I have 30, 35 lads, okay, two or three times a week on the pitch. What I do, I need to get them faster, but I'm not working with them on a one-to-one basis, okay? So I'll answer the first part as a coach in a team setting. How do I get them faster? Because reality is, if I really want to get each individual person faster, you're going to have to spend a lot of time pre-pitch focusing on their mechanics, doing a lot of hill sprints. So how can I maximize their speed and getting them quicker without having to dwell too much on it? Because I, as a coach, have to look at their condition. Also, have to look, I do the tactical and the technical side of things. So I look, have to look at their skills, have to look at the principles of play, have to try to improve the team's performance, not just S&C, but also win matches. So in a team setting, uh, GPSs, I'm a big fan of GPSs. Um, I like getting data back. And I think as a player, GPS is now very affordable. Um, and I think as a player, if you're playing at that high level and if uh, sports is incredibly important to you and it's a priority, you should make that investment into a GPS because that's going to spit back data to see improvements. So it's not like going into the gym, you put the back squat on, you've added 2.5 kilos or 5 kilos, you see a progression there. It's hard when you're doing speed work to see the progression Um without getting data back. So all my 30 players will be hooked up to GPSs and there will be a Google sheet after where I can fill out the, the speed, their top speed. And how I see their top speed is by lining them all up in let's say groups of five, you know, six in a, in a group. And they would do build into flies, which means you're building 30 meters and flying as hard as you can top speed for 10 meters. And I can see their top speed over 10 meters and I can put that in an Excel sheet and they can see it and they can see their improvements every week and we do at least one of those post dynamic warm-up every training sessions which is two max effort sprints a week now again as you get closer to the summer that can be ramped up because they're going to be able to tolerate it you wouldn't be going into pre-season and doing that amount of volume as a sprint because when you're sprinting your nervous system's getting crushed you're maxing out it's like doing a one rep max in, in the gym you know how tough that is so when a team setting um i would have them doing hill sprints which i'm very lucky to have at, my, at the parnell's pitch where we have a nice little incline so you're focused on acceleration there and then on the pitch they're doing the 30 meter builds into 10 minute flies i don't mess around with mechanics because it's going to take up too much of the session we have to be we have to be smart here um so that's in a team setting okay now also in in a that, team, just to, ju- ju- just yeah. on that shane out of curiosity just for people listening with hills do you have them running up the hill sprinting down the hill for overspeed combination or just purely incline up the hill purely incline up the hill and a good recovery walk back and the rule of thumb is every 10 meters is about 6 30 to 60 seconds recovery so it's really important that they don't just i think as ga players we feel as if we're not working hard enough unless we're absolutely keeled over bollocks so it's very important to keep that structure where they're going up the hill not 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 another mad incline okay it's just that they're getting that knee drive they're mimicking the sled push a heavy sled push in the gym so what we like to do is do the sled push in the gym and that gives them a bit of an idea of how their body shape needs to be when accelerating and then they put it into practice in the hill. Now again, if I have one player, then I'm going to spend a lot of time in mechanics. I'm really going to maybe video each hill run. I'm going to show them their, their body shape. But in a team setting, in a coaching setting, that's that's not viable. So um, I just make sure they get their hill sprints in. Nothing crazy, two or three hill sprints and then go into their, their max um, speed one to two two max per session because over the week that's four uh, which is which is plenty now that's in a coaching side of a team setting now you ask me as a player if i have a one-to-one client in my coaching app we will go through a structure of a uh, programming a uh, combined like plyometric program a sled pushing uh, program in the gym alongside doing 
hill sprints, doing your top speed, getting them to wear GPS, and maybe being a lot more detailed on the speed. But like I said, it's I'm answering questions from a coaching side and also as as an individual. But that's great though, because one of the reasons why I think the content is so helpful for people, Shane, is you have the perspective of individual coach, team coach, and as a player, and that trifecta is what allows you to add context to, right, this is why you might do plyometrics here. It's where we might be doing more priorities on hill sprints because I've got 30 people. Mm-hmm. So it's important for because sometimes players, I made this mistake myself, is you hear one thing and you assume that it applies to all contexts where it's like, no, if you're working with an individual coach or you're on a set program or you're on a team program, the context is going to be different because the more mm-hmm. individual it is, it's, but the more specific it is to you. So that's really important. You mentioned plyometrics there. Plyos is something that I think it's probably the question I get asked the most about, partly because people make a lot of mistakes with it, whether it's the rep ranges or seeing people doing it for endurance and in CrossFit settings and then applying it to GA or doing my mistake was um, um, one dimensional movements Mm. as opposed to doing your laterals. What are the biggest mistakes or issues you see with players or potentially even a misconception when it comes to plyometric based training? Another one, and just to add my one and then I'll pick your brain on all the ones you see is some players will do only plyometrics in their workout as opposed to, and they'll neglect the strength work, they'll neglect other conditioning, and they'll be like, it's all about plyometrics. I'm like, plyometrics are a tool that will support your training. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about some of the misconceptions or areas of weakness that you see with players when it comes to plyometrics in particular. Yeah, I think it's important to know when to use them and why you're using them and why you're pairing them with exercises and when to use them without the, within the season. So as a coach or as an individual uh, client i'm not going to have someone doing plyos um at the very start of the season reason being is that the intensity in plyos although you may not massively feel it it's really really high it's a power exercise you're applying as much force into the into the floor for the concentric movement which is the jump and then as you land like it's a lot of eccentric load there okay so you have to be careful like any other exercise you have to progressively overload it when do i use plyometrics i use them on the pitch as well as in the gym. So plyometrics is part of my warm-up, so my five or seven minute warm-up, just before the speed, because it's waking the nervous system up. Um, it's uh, working on those pogos, it's working on that ankle mobility, it's working on the calf strength. So there's so many benefits. Plyometrics has to be a part of your program at some stage within the year, or if not all of the year. And if you're doing it really early on, just keep the volume really low. So what would low volume look like for context? You could do one or two sets with three or four or five pogos. Just very, very simple pogos. Get like that is the lower regression. And then you can progress obviously to the really advanced where you're getting hurdles involved, you're going single leg, you're doing uh, drops as well. Like so if you ask me what does my plyometric training look like in the heat of championship, it's gonna be a lot different than it is in, in pre season because it's progression like any other exercise. Um but another thing I like as well is pairing it with a strength lift. So lower body, you could do a really heavy box squat. This is all contrast training. There's there's enough studies out there on French contrast. And if you pair it with a heavy box squat, you're getting that potentiation. And you will notice that your plyos will perform a lot better if you actually pair it with a strength exercise. So let's say you did two sets of three really heavy reps on the box squat. It's got to be heavy. And then... Take a step over and do your pogos or whether it's a single leg hurdle hop, you find that your performance is better. And then that opens up a whole new gate whenever you're talking primer sessions and how you can get your nervous system ready for matches. Um, like I played my club in, Sco- in Monaghan, Scotstown, most successful team over the last decade in Monaghan. We had a really high level coaches uh, doing s and And one thing I learned uh, from, from the last whatever years I was playing with them is how they utilize primer sessions before training. You would be coming out and train absolutely fired. Uh, you would be uh, really, really warmed up because you're keeping the volume low in the gym before you go out and the, and the intensity is through the roof. So you're doing really heavy trap bar deadlifts into let's say box jumps and then your nervous system is ready to go out onto the pitch. So plyos, Again, probably just rambling on. It's very important to know when to use them, how to use them, how to progress them, and um, always ensure they're a part of your training over the 12 months at some some point. 
the final thing I want to ask on Shane is primer sessions. You brought them up there yeah. because this is something that in the last probably three, four years has become very popular, uh, more widely studied. And now as GEA coaches, we're starting to see it filter down into club teams, etc. What are your thoughts? Can you explain first what primer sessions are for those unfamiliar with it and how you like to use them? Because there's kind of different schools of thought 24 mm. hours before, directly before, and that window of time. So explain in your words what primer sessions are and your preference for how you use them. So... The answer is really in the in the word primer. So you're priming the body um, for activity, essentially. So we all know um, professional sports. You look at the NBA, you look at American football. They're all lifting as close to to throwing or to kick off. Um, NBA basketballers will actually you know hit the gym after um, train sessions, which is which is totally fine as well. And there's such a misconception over the last decade of you should not be lifting close to your to your match which is right in a state of if the volume's too high, that will have a negative effect on your performance. But if you get this gym sessions right, then it will have a, a positive effect. So out of the whatever amount of clients I have into the into the app, in my coaching app, they, some people will be able to handle primers, some won't. So in a team setting, you've got to be careful. Can all your players handle the priming for the pitch? Like some of the lads might just step out and do a bit of stretching and then go on out in the pitch, but some people have been lifting over the last couple of years and can handle the primers. Um, so you're priming your nervous system for the, the, the train sessions. We know nervous system is a very important part in your performance. Um, ideally, you want to be waking up in a rest and digest uh, mode for training, and you want to get that nervous system to kind of turn on and nearly into fight or flight to get yourself ready. And how we do that is by going really heavy in the gym for low reps, two or three reps, and pairing it with uh, with a plyo. So your body's woken up, you did a bit of lifting, now you're ready to go in and perform and play the match. And Amazing. even on top of that, don't see primers as just priming the body. Use it as a coach. Use it as another opportunity to get a strength training session in. So for example... I need I at this time of year I need my lads in Dublin to make sure they're getting two gym sessions in a week that that they need to get two full body sessions in but does it make sense for me to take them on a Monday gym session Tuesday pitch session Wednesday okay day off Thursday pitch session Friday gym session Sunday pitch session no so what we do we compare that up so what we do is Tuesday we do 40 minutes of gym and then on to the pitch so you're not taking them out of their 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 life to do extra gym sessions so you can kind of call them primers, but they're another way of hitting your, your lifts for the week. Brilliant. Ricey, 25 minutes of just pure gold when it comes to plyometrics, primers, mistakes you've made, how GA players can learn from it. For anyone that's listening that wants to check out the app so they can work directly with you, or I have a lot of people who listen who are in charge of teams. I know you're specifically to the Dublin teams and you've got your two at the minute, but anyone that wants to reach out to you to follow on social media, to check out the app, or potentially go through and getting you in to speak with their team in some capacity, where's the best place for people to reach out? to you yeah so if you go on to gaelic athletic academy uh, dot com you'll be able to either contact me via there you can uh, sign up if you like if you want to be a part of that uh, in a membership basis and then you get your own coaching app and uh, we, we take it from there um yeah that's really obviously instagram at uh, coach shane rice and that's at Co coach shane rice on x as it's now called not twitter you can find me there waffling as well so that's where you can find me yeah amazing and for everyone listening i will link that in the description below so you can click straight on through go give shane a follow if you're not already um, and if you're watching this on youtube you can head over to the podcast check out the other episodes of the lean body podcast with GA players or if you're listening on the podcast you can head over to youtube and we have all the videos that go alongside everything shane said so if there's exercises there that you're like oh i'm not sure what that is we have the videos that are accompanying them so head over to youtube and check that out shane keep crushing it mate this is long overdue and we'll catch you again soon we won't leave it as long next time no <laughs>